Good evening and welcome to worship tonight at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Hubbard Lake. It is truly a, um, a great opportunity for us to be able to gather, not only on Sunday mornings as we typically do, but um, during this midweek season of, of Advent as we are preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ. Um, tonight we are going to be looking at um, a, an interesting lesson. It comes from the Gospels. Um, we've touched on a little bit of it over the last two midweek services, but today it's going to kind of come together um, as, um, as we look at that text from Matthew chapter 1. Um, just a couple of announcements or a couple of encouragements for you as we prepare uh, this time of worship together. We would uh, certainly encourage you and your family to, to join us in participating in worship this evening. We would love for you to join us in these great Advent hymns that we will be singing, um, following along with the readings for the scriptures. Maybe even open up your own Bible at home if, if you'd like to do that. Of course, you can just follow along right on the screen if you would like with the liturgy and the prayers um, as we uh, gather for worship tonight. Also, uh, say hello to those who are joining you because um, even though this is kind of a weird, different, unique way for us to gather, um, you are not the only one um, participating and worshiping tonight. There are other people, um, not only members of this congregation, but, but members of the body of Christ um, that are gathered together at different places, perhaps even different times. Um, so welcome them in the name of the Lord. Share the peace of Christ um, and, uh, and, and wish them a, a happy and blessed Advent season as we um, get ready to conclude this time of the church year and prepare for Christmas. That being said, let us begin our time of worship tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Although Nathan condemned David, you have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife. She bore a son, and he shall call his name Solomon. Paul writes that although we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. When John baptized Jesus, a voice came down from heaven saying, You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. We continue this evening with the responsive liturgy of our psalmody. This psalm, perhaps by David, reflects on a life marked by scandal and conflict. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been as a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together and say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. This great O Antiphon asks God for relief from spiritual darkness. O day spring, splendor of light everlasting, come and enlighten those who sit in the darkness and the shadow of death.
Our first reading for this evening comes from 2 Samuel chapter 12, selected verses from the chapter. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord, to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Then Nathan went to his house, and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground, and the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day the child died, but the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him the child is dead? He may do himself some harm. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and went into her, and lay with her. And she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this evening comes from Titus chapter 3, beginning at the third verse. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The third reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter beginning at the fourth verse. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him, and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and wore a leather belt around his waist, and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit." In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. She bore a son, Solomon. He saved us according to his own mercy, not because of works done by us. He saved us according to his own mercy. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He saved us according to his own mercy.
and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Tonight we're going to be looking at something kind of interesting. We're going to be looking at a portion or a small section of the genealogy of Jesus. Now last week we talked about um, Rahab, the prostitute, before that, we kind of made the connection between um, King David and, uh, and our Lord. And now we are going to look at kind of this genealogy as a whole, or at least a portion of that genealogy, as we read it in Matthew chapter 1. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, and we thank you for this time to be able to spend it together learning and growing from your word. We ask, Lord, that your word would speak into the very depths of our hearts, that we would recognize our own sinfulness and um, our desire to stray from you and from your word and your will for our lives. Call us, Lord, to repentance, whereby we might receive the free gift of forgiveness that is ours in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, while we certainly have some things in our background and in our past that we are not proud of, some shame and some guilt and maybe even some individuals that we don't like to talk about from our own families. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us recognize to see our own sinfulness. Help us to see that there are people in your history who maybe aren't all that great, and yet, Heavenly Father, from that you have brought and extended to them grace and mercy. Teach us, Lord, that regardless of who we are and what we have done, your mercy extends to everyone. And Father, help us to take that grace and that mercy with us, 
that through our words and actions, the gospel of Jesus may go with us wherever we go. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Shannon Lanier is a news anchor stationed out of Houston, Texas, but he also happens to be the fifth great-grandson of Madison Hemings. And maybe you don't know Madison Hemings. I'll explain who he is in a few moments, but he is certainly a son of a scandal. Now, like many families, Lanier's family has a scandal in their past, skeletons in their closet that goes back quite some time. In fact, it goes all the way back to one of our nation's founding fathers. On July 4th, 1826, 50 years exactly after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson died after his health had been failing for some time. In addition to all of the, of course, numerous contributions that Thomas Jefferson made to this country, he had several hobbies and interests like law, education, and even architecture. During his life, Jefferson served in many different capacities. He was a governor, secretary of state, he served as a congressman, vice president, and of course was eventually president of the United States. During his, mis during his administration, there were some significant things that happened, both the Lewis and Clark expedition and also Lo the Louisiana Purchase took place. Jefferson, without question, left a lasting legacy upon this nation, both in his leadership and through his writing of the Declaration. But Jefferson was not a perfect guy. He had a scandal in his background. You may or may not know this, but after his wife Martha died, Jefferson began a relationship with one of his slaves by the name of Sally Hemings. And from their relationship, Sally and Thomas Jefferson went on to have four children, one of whom was Madison Hemings or Shannon Lanier's great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. That's right, Jefferson, who is, of course, known for his leadership, known for defending freedom, is the same guy who kept his own flesh and blood for slaves for many years. Now, eventually, just before his death, Jefferson would free his adult children that he had with Sally Hemings, but he is without question a flawed hero, a flawed hero who is remembered not only for his accomplishments, but also for his scandal. In the Gospel of Matthew, we see that Jesus' family background is filled with scandal. And maybe you didn't realize this, but it's filled with scandal. There's a woman in there by the name of Tamar, whose husband was killed by the Lord because he was evil. And she was unable to get a new husband as a result. So she disguises herself as a harlot and sleeps with her father-in-law, Judah. She conceives twins, and one of those twins would be the ancestor of Christ. Rahab, a prostitute, we looked at her in great length last week, would also be included in the lineage of Jesus. On our first midweek uh, Advent time together, we looked at King David. Now, we didn't actually talk about King David um, in great length as far as his scandal, but David committed murder. He also committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba, and from their illicit relationship comes Solomon, future king. There's also Ruth, who is a Gentile, should not really be included in the line of Jesus, and yet she's grafted in, and she too is included in the genealogy. So it's all over the place, right? This family history has it all. Incest, prostitution, Gentiles, adultery, murder. It's got everything. One scandal after another. And not only is it included in the Bible, but these are the ancestors of the Messiah. Now, most people, I think, would be absolutely horrified to find out that these folks are in their lineage 
And yet God shows us here that no one, absolutely no one, is beyond his grace. Now Thomas Jefferson's family, it may be filled with scandal, but is their family, any, is, is their family really any different than our own? Is Jefferson's family any different than ours? Or is our family, too, filled with scandal? We maybe have these conversations. Who is welcome? Who isn't? Who is legitimate? Who is not? These questions plague just more than the Jefferson family. In fact, they probably plague our own families at some level. The individuals that are included in our Lord's genealogy really tell us more about the grace of God than they do about the individual themselves. In fact, Martin Franzman is a theologian of the church, and he once wrote, They are firmly enmeshed in the history of God's chosen people, and their presence speaks eloquently of the face that this history is not the story of man's glory, but of God's grace. This history, these people being enmeshed in this history, are a part of the story not of man's glory, but of God's grace. God's grace. It's easy for us to look back at our histories, to look back at our lineage and our families and really at the families of others and find scandal, find things that we're not proud of, things that maybe we are ashamed of. But the truth is, we don't have to look that hard within our own families, within our own lives. Our actions have separated us from God. We are no different than they are. We are all prodigal sons and daughters who have rejected our father and rejected even our family of faith that he has brought us into. We have sold our birthright of sorts to satisfy our own appetite for sin. We have not hungered and thirsted after righteousness. Rather, we have sought to fill our own sinful desires by seeking after the pleasures of the world. And in our sin... What has happened is we have become enemies of God. And so the truth is we're no better than Tamar or Rahab or Ruth or David or Bathsheba or anyone else for that matter because we share in their humanity and therefore we share in their sin. But as the scripture tells us, we received the spirit of adoption as sons so that we are children of God and if children then heirs, co-heirs with Christ. When Paul writes to Titus, which we heard read a few moments ago, he says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. He saved us, not because of the works that are done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing and regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's according to God's own mercy given to us through the Holy Spirit in the waters of baptism, whereby we are renewed and regenerated and justified by grace through the work of Christ Jesus. The word of God, the word of God the Father, spoken to us through Jesus, when, or spoken to us as he speaks it to Jesus when he was baptized, is ultimately words that are spoken to us as well. Let me say that again. The words of God the Father that are spoken to Jesus are ultimately spoken to us as Christ is baptized. Remember what God the Father says to his son? You are my beloved son with whom, with whom I am well pleased. Baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection, the Father looks down upon you and he says, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, with you I am well pleased. It's by the grace of God, 
found in Christ Jesus that we have been invited to celebrate together as brothers and sisters in Christ at the heavenly banquet. The Father has lavished upon us his love as we see it in his Son, Jesus Christ, and because of that love, we are now called sons and daughters. He invites us by his grace to the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. It is truly a family reunion, and God makes you and me a part of it. But it's a family reunion like no other, especially when you consider the family, especially when you consider that it's full of liars and cheats and thieves and adulterers, and murderers, meddlers, there's con artists and addicts, those who are arrogant and those who are ignorant, hard-hearted and hard-headed individuals, those who are greedy and those who are needy, students that are being frozen by fear because of the future that they have to look forward to, adults that are haunted by the ghosts of their past. Yes, the family of God and our faith family is full of all kinds. All kinds of people. People with warts and bruises and scars and scandals and skeletons and filth and wretchedness. People that are filled with sin. People with all kinds of things in their past that they don't want to talk about. That they're ashamed of. And yet, we are one family in Christ, united together through the death and resurrection of Jesus and awaiting the blessed reunion in heaven with those who have gone on before us. That's the inheritance that we have to look forward to. That's why we are preparing during this Advent season. That's what we are looking forward to. Never earned only given by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. You know, over the last several years, there's been lots of companies like Ancestry.com and 23andMe, and they have made genealogies this, this very fascinating thing, an endeavor for people to look at who's been their past, where they come from, um, their DNA, all kinds of things like that. And, you know, we look at the family tree of Jesus and we see that it's more than just something fascinating for us to look back and see. It is life. We have been adopted into the family of God and made heirs of the inheritance. We have been given eternal life. You see, Jesus' family tree is your family tree. And ultimately, your family tree is the tree of Calvary on which your Savior died for you and for all the family. It's a saving scandal. But it's a saving scandal that made you a part of this family of God because of his grace. May God grant that unto us all. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Um, as we have been doing um, for some time now, we are continuing to encourage you that if you would like to make a, um, a gift during this Advent season, um, an offering unto the Lord, um, that you would do that by either dropping it off here at the church or even mailing it here to the office you can go online and give through our online giving platform. You can even text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 989-309-2496. Again, we want to thank you for um, your commitment, your cheerful giving, um, your act of worship as you have been so faithful in your offerings, allowing us as the body of Christ to continue to reach out, um, not only to our faith family here at St. Paul, but even beyond the four walls of this building um, to the people that are in our community. That being said, uh, let us continue our time of worship together with the singing of our Benedictus. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he 
would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Lord Jesus, guide and protect clergy and lay leaders of your church. Enable them to lift people's hearts and minds to look beyond global pandemics, natural disasters, and political upheavals to see the eternal kingdom which you have graciously opened to all people who trust in you for life and health and peace. Bless those who till the soil, manage farms, transport supplies, and distribute food and clothing where they are needed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Lord, give wisdom and courage to those who lead governments, command armed forces, and maintain order in society. Give them hearts to seek peace, so that warfare with neighbor states and civil strife within them give way to prosperity, health, and cooperation. Increase our faith to depend on your eternal promises of the better country that awaits us by grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, light of the world, open the hearts of all who are burdened by their scandals and other past sins. Surround them with faithful people to tell them about your coming in human history, to give yourself for them. Protect and guide all law enforcement personnel, first responders, healthcare workers, and counselors. Give them balance of justice, mercy, and compassionate care, so that many may have their lives repaired and hope restored. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O gracious Lord, cared for by your adopted human father, Joseph, remember people like him, those who have been forgotten, whether dispossessed, incarcerated, or isolated for any reason. Remember not their sins and iniquities, but give them a sense of your abiding presence. Nurture in us all a love for your will, so that we obedient do, obediently do whatever you ask. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Servant Savior, born in a stable to a lowly virgin, remind us again that you turn the world's ways upside down. Give strength to the weak, lift up the downtrodden, provide hope for the despairing, announce peace to the distraught, and proclaim eternal forgiveness to all burdened by their sin. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, the people included in your family tree dealt with scandalous sin within and around them. And yet, from them, you graciously entered human history. Help us to see your grace at work within us, we who have been grafted into your family tree by baptism. Strengthen us to truly be your forgiven and adopted brothers and sisters. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and Merciful Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen. We close this evening with our final hymn, The Advent of Our King. Thank you for joining us this evening as we were able to gather together online. Um, this is our last Advent midweek service. This is our very last one, um, which means that um, after this coming Sunday, which is the fourth Sunday in Advent, um, our next worship service will be on Christmas Eve. Just about our Christmas worship services, we will have an in-person Christmas Eve worship service at 6 p.m., we will also offer a worship service online at 6 p.m. on that same night. Christmas Day, however, will only be online. We will only have an online worship service at 9.30 a.m. on Christmas morning. Uh, one other announcement is that this coming Sunday, we have our, um, our final voters' assembly meeting for the year. There is a number of things on the agenda, um, really too much to even share um, in an announcement fashion. However, um, that agenda is compiled in the office. 
You can call, talk to Monica. She'd be more than happy to let you know what is on that agenda. She can email it to you. She can drop it in the mail. Um, you can speak to me or anyone else on council if you have any questions about that agenda. Um, but please uh, make sure that you make note of that. Um, that meeting is this coming Sunday, okay, the 20th of December, following in-person worship. Again, any questions um, or any information that you desire on the agenda, please call the office. Uh, that's it for this evening. Um, again, don't forget about the giving tree. If you want, uh, there's still time for the giving tree. Um, you can come get items here. You can make a donation to the giving tree, whatever you would like to do. There is still time um, to reach out and to help um, as we look to help our community during this Christmas season. Um, so don't forget about that. And we will see you Sunday, whether it be in person um, or, or right here online on Facebook, YouTube, or our website. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.